How effective is your marketing? Are you attracting the right clients to your company that you are able to engage with in project opportunities and build projects for that make you money? That's the whole goal of marketing. And that's exactly why it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Alan Dibb to Construction Genius. He is the founder of SuccessWise and the author of the One Page Marketing Plan. He is an expert in marketing. And today's discussion, we're going to dive into what marketing actually is, why it's important, and how you can build a marketing strategy that will enable you to attract the right clients to your organization, to your company, so that you can build profitable projects and build long-term successful relationships. Feel free to share this interview with other people who would benefit from insights into marketing. Um, if you're not driving around, I encourage you to take notes because Alan has a number of practical uh, insights and suggestions that you can execute on right away. And if you found this interview valuable, feel free to give us a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Construction Genius today and enjoy my discussion with Alan. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Alan, welcome to Construction Genius. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Eric. Pleasure to be on the show. I'm having you on here today because I know that you're an expert in marketing and I really value your insights. Just to kick us off here to lay a strong foundation at the beginning, what is marketing? So marketing is how you get your ideal client to know you, like you, and trust you enough to do business with you. That's my very, very short definition of marketing. Okay. So let's dive into that a little bit. Let's talk about the ideal client. People who are listening to the show today, they're commercial contractors. They have an idea of who their ideal client is. How do you go about helping your, your clients to define that ideal client? Yeah. So uh, this is where very often I see a mistake that people make is where they say, hey, I'm in construction or I'm in finance or I'm in uh, legal or whatever, and I can help everyone who's got a construction problem or who's got a legal problem or who's got a medical problem or whatever. And so if we segmented your customer base, there would be some customers who absolute the dream customer for you. They're profitable. They're fun to work with. They value what you do. And then there'll be ones who are kind of like... You know, maybe you don't really look forward to working with them. Maybe they complain about price. Maybe they're difficult to work with, whatever else. So there'll be someone within your current list of clients who is an absolute ideal client, and there are some who are not. Now, they will have many commonalities. So it may be by geography. It might be by demographics. It may be by size. It may be by industry. It may be by a, a whole host of factors. And so it's important for you to understand who you enjoy working with, who's going to value what you do, going to be very, very profitable at the end of the day. And so if you're already in business, that's something where you can do a little bit of an analysis uh, on your current customer base. And, you know, if you run a profit and loss on uh, your various customer segments, you'll find there are ones that are way more profitable and way easier to service and pay on time and, and not difficult to work with versus others. And so, so if you're in business, you would do that kind of analysis. If you're not yet in business, then that's something where you need to do a little bit of research and, and some trial and error as well. Okay. So most of the folks who are listening to this, they're already in business. And so they've already got that data from the projects that they're running of which ones they make money on, which ones they lose money on, who's a pain in the neck and who's good to work with. Exactly. Now, now why is it that some companies kind of dig their heels in and not really do this kind of work? What stops them from spending the time to identify that ideal client? The, the, the biggest thing that stops them is they feel like they can't say no to any business. They feel like all revenue is good revenue. And here's the thing that I've seen in my work as a business coach and as a business consultant, and I've, I've been on the boards of different companies, is that 
a dollar is not equal. The, the is, I call it the principle of the unequal dollar. So a dollar from one type of customer is not equal to a dollar from another type of customer. And, and I talk about in my book. I talk about optimal customers and suboptimal customers, and I, I talk about polluted revenue. Polluted revenue is revenue that comes from suboptimal customers. So uh, they're customers who may be can't afford what you do, either based on time or ba based on price. Maybe they complain a lot. They always want to talk to the CEO or the managing director or whatever. They pay late. They're difficult to work with. And then there are optimal customers who are net promoters of your business. So one customer is not equal to one customer. They refer new business to you. They buy your higher level products and services. They don't complain about price. They pay on time. All of those things that we discussed in our target market discussion. And so a dollar from those customers who become raving fans, who become promoters of your business, who are conspiring for your success is far more valuable than a dollar from a suboptimal customer who is not profitable, who's difficult to deal with, who's all those things, despite what your bank manager will tell you. And so if you can concentrate on your most optimal customers, the people who give you the most return for your time, money, and energy, you're going to grow your business far, far quicker than if you are you take your all things to all people and you take all revenue on board. Okay. So let's say you've identified your optimal customer, your target client, your ideal client. How do you then turn that information into a message that's going to attract more of those types of people? Well, the beauty is once we've really identified who our target market is, we can now create messaging that really lands with that target market. And here's the thing, like if you're more general, if you say, look, I'm all things to all people, I'm going to take all types of revenue and all types of clients on, then by necessity, your message has to be general. And a general message just doesn't connect with an audience as well as a specific message. So the goal of your message is to say, hey, it is for your target market to say, hey, that's for me. If your message is too general, then no one's ever going to say that they're going to, you'll be listing a whole laundry list of products and services that you do. And it's not going to have that effect on your target market where they say, wow, that's exactly me. That's my situation. That's what I need. And so that's why selecting your target market is the first step. Creating then messaging that really lands with that target market is the next step. And so the messaging that really lands is the thing that's kind of going on in their mind. So it's entering the conversation that's already happening in their mind. So if you know your target market well, you're going to know a lot of the problems that they have right now. So what are the things that are keeping them awake at 3 a.m.? What are the things that their hopes, their dreams, their desires? You're going to be able to tap into that if you know your target market very well. And then you can create messaging that really lands where someone, wow, I really need that. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you click onto a website and you're looking for a specific product and it addresses exactly what you're looking for. It's like, yes, that's exactly exactly what I've been looking for. And by the time you know it, you've hit the buy now button and you've checked out in there, check out. And so whether you have an online system for people buying or not, you really want that message to land where they say, yes, that's for me. That's what I need. So in a, in a marketing message, in, in your experience, is it better to emphasize the pleasure that people want to uh, gain from using someone's services or the pain that they'll experience if they don't? Do you have an opinion on that, a perspective? I think you want to have a good balance of both, but definitely pain avoidance is more effective than seeking pleasure. You know, people will do much more in terms of avoiding a fear of loss rather than having a fear of gain. So in my opinion, uh, the, going negative sometimes uh, gets a better response. Okay. But test, test both approaches most definitely. That's interesting. So, so that idea of testing, tell, let's explore that a little bit. What is mm. the role of testing in effective marketing? It's absolutely central. So you need to, you know, sometimes we might speculate, we might think this is a message that I think will land with the audience. And you might ask your colleagues and your, and your friends and your family and all of that sort of thing. And that's kind of irrelevant, really. We want to know what our target market actually responds to. So we want the data from actual prospects to be informing our decisions around messaging, around our offers, around our pricing, around our packaging, all of those sorts of things. And so speculation is a good start. So where you say, look, I think this is what will land with my audience, but then 
we want feedback from the marketplace. We want the data to tell us, hey, this is landing or this is not landing. And for that to inform our marketing direction. So testing and measuring on a consistent basis is really, really important. And now with the digital tools that we have these days, it's easy to do. There are website analytics tools that tells us if something's converting. There are heat mapping tools that tell us, look, at what's getting the most clicks on our website and what are people trying to do there. So this has now become far easier to do than ever before. And so there's no excuse for not testing and measuring because you want to be continually optimizing your marketing. So if something's not converting, you want to see why is that happening and then test something else. So testing and measuring, super important. Okay. So, so when I asked you at the beginning, of the interview, I asked you, what is marketing? Can you just repeat that phrase one more time, please? Yeah. So marketing is the strategy that you use to get your ideal target market to know you, like you, and trust you enough to do business with you. Okay. So, so when you say no trust and like, that immediately turns on my sales antenna because I always teach my clients that people buy from people that they know, trust, and like. So how do you distinguish between marketing and sales? So the difference between marketing and, and sales is in the ideal scenario, we would always be one-to-one -one in person with our ideal target market. Now, that's not always possible or practical, particularly now with the whole pandemic. But even prior to the pandemic, I mean, we can only see so many people in a day. We can only talk to so many people in a day. And so marketing is how we do sales in a one-to-many fashion. So how can we talk to many people at the same time? So that's really, to me, the difference between sales and marketing. There are, of course, many subtle differences. And depending on industry, people will separate those two uh, differently. But to me, good marketing is essentially sales, but it's on a one-to-many basis. I see. Okay. So good marketing is, is by no means a replacement for sales but it's it's a means of talking to more people and kind of getting them into your sales funnel. Is that the idea there? Exactly, exactly. So we want to connect with your audience. We want to create that connection. And, you know, I've heard Peter Drucker say that the goal of marketing is to make sales uh, obsolete, essentially. So mm -hmm. to essentially turn sales into order taking. And I, I certainly agree with that. If you've got good marketing, if you know who your target market is, if you've got good messaging, if you take them through a nurturing campaign, then by the time you get to the sales process, it should be essentially a matter of, taking the order. So that's how you know you've got really good marketing if your salespeople are essentially order takers. Okay. So that's interesting because I know in the environment that a lot of my listeners are in, they're not necessarily in that order taking mode in terms of sales because, you know, someone, let's say I have a uh, piece of land and I want to build a, a commercial building on it. And it's going to be a, let's say a 20, $30 million project or something like that. I'm not necessarily Googling contractors who can build a $20 million project. There's, no. there, it's not a pay-per-click kind of environment. Environment. It's very much a relational one. So how does marketing play into that type of environment? Okay. So that's a really, really good point. So uh, your audience are Googling something, right? And that it's your goal to find out what that is. And it's your goal to really figure out what is it that they are typing into that Google search engine. Now, as you rightly said, probably no one's typing in, you know, who can build me a $20 million building but they would be Googling things like in their area, what kind of permits are required to build that kind of building or what kind of council bureaucracy do they need to deal with or, or whatever else. And so if you can provide them helpful information, helpful content that will get them a result in advance, then you'll be in a box seat to provide them that product or that service. So really the goal of your content marketing, whether it be uh, on Google or Facebook or pay-per-click ads or whatever else, is to help give your target audience a result in advance. And so they are definitely typing something into Google and it's your job to figure out what that is and help them with that content, help them with the results. Okay. So let's explore that a little bit more because that, that's a little bit, no, it's not counterintuitive. It's a bit of a leap, right? I'm getting into the head of my prospect, I'm someone who might be looking for commercial construction services and I'm asking, what are they thinking in advance? Mm. What's the result they want in advance? Can you just explore that a little bit more, please? So it's like, it's like a, you know, we need to be like a chess master where we're thinking three, five, 10 moves in advance. So where we're thinking through the whole process, too many people think about the end result, which is kind of customer buying from me, which is great. Okay. We, we of course want people to buy from us and that's all good, but really between them needing your product and service and then 
pu pulling the trigger with someone and, and buying something, particularly if it's something that's a large transaction, there may be five, 10, 20, 30 steps. And so we need to think some of those steps through. So someone building a commercial building, they may be researching land or they may be, they may have bought land already, or maybe, you know, so there would be a huge number of steps. Maybe they're hiring an architect. Maybe they're working with, uh, they're researching the types of buildings that are available. So like a chess master, we need to be thinking through what are some of the likely touch points that they're going to have along the buying journey before they sign up with someone who's a who's in construction, who can build the building for them. And so we need to always be thinking about what's the next physical, visible action that they're going to take. So in my business, for example, one of the things that I do, I, I provide coaching and consulting to clients. Now I know ahead of that, there are going to be multiple steps before they qualify to go along to that final stage and buy from me. And so one of the steps is I want them to opt in on my email list to make sure that I'm able to keep in touch with them. So the goal of my website and my marketing on my website is not to sell my services, but to get people to opt in on my mailing list. And then when they're on my mailing list, I know that they're going to get content from me on a regular basis. So my next step there is to engage with them through back and forth email conversations. So at every stage, you need to be thinking, what's the next visible physical step that I want them to take leading up to the final stage, which might be the, the purchase. So that's where you really want to think through the whole buying journey, not just the final end result. That's that's beautiful. What are the biggest mistakes that people make with their marketing? Where do they waste money and time? One of the biggest wastes I see is they focus too much on branding and design and logos and things like that. I don't know about you, but I've never bought anything in my life because I like the logo of the company or whatever, right? So, and I'm not saying don't don't invest in good design and things like that. Absolutely, we want things to be visually appealing, look nice, uh, all of those sorts of things. But I've seen companies who've spent like twenty thousand dollars on a visual rebrand and a logo and everything like that, and they think that that's going to automatically get them sales, and it doesn't. It might be part of your overall marketing strategy, but really, what you want to concentrate on is how can I spend Spend a dollar and get a dollar or more back in profits from my marketing. So that's really the name of the game. See, that's some very good insight there. The the branding, I, and I agree with you because I don't think anyone buys a construction project or engages with a general contractor or even a subcontractor because their logo is sweet. <laughs> so that's, exactly. that's a very, very, very important part. So let me ask you this then. In terms of marketing, in a crowded field, there's tens of thousands of contractors in the United States alone. I know in my market... There's, you get this feeling of, you know, this sort of generic general contractor look and feel, and maybe with the subs as well. How does someone stand out from the crowd in terms of their marketing if they're not necessarily going to be emphasizing the branding and the logo and all that kind of stuff? I think, I mean, construction is such a wide space. And yes. so knowing who your customer is and specializing in something. So maybe you specialize in multi develop, multi unit developments, yeah. or maybe you specialize in converting buildings to a higher level of rent or, or whatever yeah. else. So I think one thing you could do is definitely specialize. So figure out who your ideal target market is and really specialize that in a, on its own will differentiate you from probably 90% of other builders who just say, Hey, yeah, we'll just build you anything that you need. Right. Doing that. And then, the next step would be becoming someone who's an educator and someone who's essentially taking a leadership role within your niche. So if you specialize in bu building a certain type of building, now you want to create a lot of content around that help your ideal target market, learn and educate and provide a lot of content around that. I think someone in construction should have someone on their team who's in charge of content creation because, I mean, let's face it, building, it's an interesting industry, right? So there's lots happening, there's machinery, there's all sorts of things. Yep. So you can create a ton of content for your ideal target market to really uh, differentiate yourself. So I think if you did those two things, if you specialized in something and then you were became an 
an educator who's really taking an authority role in that niche, then you're going to go a long way to differentiating yourself from what others do. Excellent. Excellent. And so it's interesting because earlier on, you talked about the importance of playing the chess game so that you mm. know where your, your target market is, what they're doing prior to actually engaging with you. And then yes. you also spoke about understanding where people are going on your website. And so it, it, I know that, you know, that's not necessarily in, in the, the core competency of many of the construction company owners. So would you give that same advice to, to have someone either in-house or um, outsourced who really understands the metrics of websites and understands where people are going on your website so you can get some insight into what's most important? I firmly believe that you need to have someone internal to your team who's running the marketing. Now, they don't have to be a genius who knows every kind of type of marketing and every type of system, but it needs to be someone who wakes up in the morning and thinks about marketing your business. So we call that role usually a marketing coordinator within yep. the business. And a large part of what I do with my team is help place those kind of people within companies and upskill them and run the day-to-day the -day marketing. In terms of who does what, that's something that the marketing co coordinator would run. So if you need to get a specialist who's a Google ad specialist in, that's where your marketing coordinator will come in. They, they'll make sure that they get the right analytics, the right cost per click and managing that whole process. But you need someone in your business who wakes up in the morning and thinks, right, okay, what, what are we doing today in terms of marketing the business? Let's talk about that then. So let's say I have someone in my company who is a marketing coordinator. How do I know that they're doing a good job? How can I track that? Because again, a lot of the folks listening to this who perhaps own a company or are in senior leadership, they haven't come up through marketing. They've come up through building projects. Mm. So give me some insights there, please. The ultimate metric is, is it making me more than I'm spending on it, right? So that, that's really the ultimate metric. Now, obviously from day one, you're going to need to have other metrics because there's a uh, ramp up period. So they're obviously not going to be giving you a return on investment from day one. I mean, sometimes that they can be if they're, they're really skilled and they know exactly your industry and know what you're doing. But more likely than not, there's going to be a trial and error phase. There's going to be a ramp up phase. And so you want to create a handful of metrics that are relevant for you or your industry. So they may be metrics like website visits, opt-in conversions, marketing qualified leads that have been sent up to, to sales, all of those kind of metrics. So different metrics for different businesses, but there'll usually be a handful of maybe five, six, seven metrics that are relevant for you and your business where you can track, hey, we're doing better this month than last month and the month before or whatever. Or conversely, hey, something's dropped. The number of marketing qualified leads going to sales has dropped. What's happening? Has something happened to the website? Are we advertising in the wrong place? or whatever else. So there'll be a handful of metrics that make sense to you, but ultimately the ultimate metric is dollars out versus dollars in. That's great. So I've got those three specific ones there that perhaps a marketing coordinator should be tracking. Website visits, opt-ins, and that goes back to your earlier point about being an educator. So having something on your website that a prospect could download that would be informative to them and then qualified leads to sales. I just want to make sure I've got those three covered. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Excellent. So if let's say again, um, I, I understand that marketing is something I should be doing. I, I need to be able to target my core market and begin to attract people who um, are, I'm developing a relationship with. If I was to start off the next 90 days and really make an emphasis on marketing, what would be three or four action items that you would counsel a construction company owner or leader to really be focusing on to kickstart their marketing? Okay, perfect. So, and this is, we do this on a daily basis. It's re, you need to think through do I have the right tools? Do I have the right assets? And do I have the right processes in place? So tools from a marketing perspective, things like your CRM system, your website content management system, we need the right technical tools. It's kind of like, you know, if, uh, if I'm uh, building something, I need a hammer, I need a saw, I need all of those same things. Yeah, yeah, so do, yeah. we have, do we have the actual tools? Then the assets, do we have the right assets in place, meaning things like email copy. What do you mean by email copy? 
So for example, if someone opts in on your website, do you have the right emails that are going to go out to them in a sequenced manner? So on day one, they receive this email. Day two, they receive that email. Day three, whatever else. Your website copy. So what wording and what copy is going to go on, on your website? Do you have a, a an industry report or a free report or some downloadable that, that they can use to get a result in advance as we discussed? So they're examples of assets. And then finally, we tie that up with processes. And processes are who's going to do what and when. So what are we going to do from a marketing perspective on a daily, weekly, and a monthly basis? So if we figured out, it's look, it's a really good idea for us to create a lot of content. Okay, great. We need to figure out three things. So who, what, and when. Who is going to create that blog post and how often? So we might say, look, Mary uh, on the first day of every month needs to create one piece of high quality content that's a thousand words long. So that becomes a process in the business. And that's how you win at marketing. Too many people treat marketing like an event, like something that you do once, one big splash, one big rebrand, whatever. And so that's where they go wrong. The people who win at marketing are the people who treat it like a process. So what are we going to do from a marketing perspective daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, so on and so forth. So, And so that's how you win at marketing, by tying up the tools, assets, and processes and getting those in place. That's terrific. Thank you. That is some very actionable items there. Okay, so just wrapping up, Alan, obviously marketing to some people, it's a bit of an enigma. Um, it mm. does require a lot of hard work. It's not just throwing up a website and a sweet logo and hoping for the best. If someone is looking to get some help in terms of their marketing, how might they be able to reach out to you? Um, wh- how can we get in touch with you? I can be reached at successwise.com. My personal email address is alan at successwise.com, but certainly reach out on my website. You can join my mailing list. Book the one-page marketing plan it is available on Amazon and everywhere that books are sold. And if you're not a reader, if you prefer to listen, it's on Audible dot com as well. So um, they're probably the best ways to to reach me. Excellent. Excellent. Make sure that all those links are in the uh, show notes, the one page marketing plan. I have the book. It is an excellent book. So uh, you should definitely check that out. Um, Alan, I know you're over there in Australia. Um, What part of Australia are you in? I'm in Melbourne. Melbourne. Okay. So let's say the COVID ends and I'm going to travel over to Melbourne and I want to hit the best restaurant in Melbourne. Where am I going? Best restaurant in Melbourne. De- depends what you like. I-, I like a... Yeah. What's your favorite restaurant in Melbourne? I like an Indian restaurant called Naranka in uh, in Melbourne. So uh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And that's in Melbourne. I'm, g- I'm going to make sure that's in the show notes just in case we have any Australian listeners. <laughs> I know that we do have Australian listeners and also for anyone visiting Australia. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Alan, I really appreciate your time. You've been very generous. I'm going to make sure those links are in the show notes to contact you. And uh, thank you for joining me today here on Construction Genius. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure being on. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes, share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit, and always remember that the show is brought to you by Kick-Ass Meetings. I've been working with construction leaders since 2004, teaching them how to run extremely effective problem-solving meetings that gets their people collaborating, taps into their creativity, and to get yourself a free copy of the Kick-Ass Meeting Report, go to www.ericanderton.com slash kickassmeetings. Grab yourself that free report, read it, use it in your business. You'll find it extremely useful. And thanks again for listening.